So we saw Trevor Lawrence get a massive new contract last week, and there's been a lot of discussion centering around which quarterback will be next. But there is a problem with quarterback contracts that I think you need to warn us all about. Yeah, and so this is kind of part question, part warning that I want to bring up to you and kind of present an option and see what you think about it. But yeah, can we solve the quarterback contract problem? Because it's no secret that these things are getting out of hand, especially when it comes to what I would consider at times mediocre and bad quarterbacks. Not to say that the guys on your graphic, Dak Prescott's not a bad quarterback, but immediately my mind goes to last offseason, right? And I know it's low-hanging fruit, but when the Giants told us that Daniel Jones was worth $30 $30 million more than Saquon Barkley. And especially in a sport where we talk so much about it being the ultimate team sport, right? You need all 11 guys. In order for one person to have success, everybody has to be working together. So while quarterback is the most important position, there are other players that in times when compared to the quarterbacks are actually more valuable, it feels like, in certain moments. And what I would like to see happen, and I'm curious your thoughts on how we could institute this fix, is seeing players that actually have a demonstrated proven impact on winning getting rewarded for that. Um, Yet, to your point, like we look at Trevor Lawrence right here, who is the most, the highest average annual value quarterback in the National Football League, yet he has one playoff win, one Pro Bowl, no all pros, and is coming off a season where he was injured and led the league in turnovers. You wrote in your VEASAN column last week, the positional market in the NFL salary structure dictates price regardless of talent level or contribution towards winning. That's terrible. Like that sounds like we need a market (laughs) correction. So what's the answer? Is it something more similar to what we see in the NBA, more specifically how we have those super max contracts where a player, is this possible where a player like must have reached a certain criteria or a certain level of accomplishment or honor or award to garner a certain tiered level of contract? Do you think that that would be doable and reasonable in the NFL? No, because I think the the reason they're getting the money, Stormy, is simply because we can't say no. It's like the fork I can't put down. It's like you can lose weight. All you have to do because there's no alternative because the media is so worried. You know, if you I mean, look, you know, you got people out there defending Daniel. Jones. How many times did you see Daniel Jones's contract compared to his stats compared to Trevor Lawrence? People do it all the time. He's just as good, and they paid him, so it makes the Giants okay. Look, there's nobody that has enough conviction until somebody, maybe it's Jerry Jones, says, you know what? I'm not paying that. I'm going to draft a guy, and we're going to start this thing over. Look, there's nobody in the league that didn't like Derek Carr more than the owner. More than the owner. He, he tried to get Gruden to get rid of him. He tried to get Rich Bisacci and then Josh McDaniel. He, he was not on board with Carr. But the problem was everybody knew once they got rid of Carr and they didn't win, he was going to fire him. Right? You can't have it both ways. You want to get rid of Carr, great. Then we're going to have to suck it up and figure out how we're going to get another quarterback. But nobody wants to do that. So they just pay out. And now, like the Rams, they're going to pay double because what's their alternative? I agree. Your warning is correct. But the only answer is put the fork down. It's the only answer. That's the thing. Like, shouldn't at some point common sense and cooler heads prevail? That's what I don't understand. Why are we just accepting this? Well, because there's no, because A, the owners are making so much money, it's not reaching into their pocket. Right. It's like we used to say this all the time at the Raiders. You know, you can give Charles Woodson 12 million a year, but God forbid if we mm. order two legal pads because <laughs> the legal pads come out of the pocket of the owner. The, the 12 million comes out of the salary cap. So I, I think at the end of the day, as long as the owners are making the money. But if it was a free enterprise, if it was capitalism at its finest, where you only got paid if you won, I don't think these numbers would be like this. But everybody's fat and happy. Let's go on to college football. There's college towns that I love to go to. Tuscaloosa is one of them. Ann Arbor. Athens, Georgia is incredible. And there's always huge expectations. And you travel all over to these places to win and win big. But you believe better should avoid that these teams' assumptions that they're going to win big. So yesterday we went through a handful of college football futures with the angle surrounding them of all of the changes of head coaches in college football, specifically at the top, the ripple effect of the Nick Saban 
retirement, right? And it got me really thinking about some of the numbers about these teams. And just because a program has name value or brand recognition doesn't automatically mean we can assume that they're going to have success again this year. Alabama, for example, as you referenced, a perennial contender under Nick Saban ranks 115th in the country in returning production. And I love Kalen DeBoer. I think he's a tremendous coach with a proven track record of success. But that's significant. Michigan won a national championship last year. They're 128th in returning production of only 134 schools in FBS football. And their win total is nine. And they're an odds on number to make the playoff. Even Washington, who will put in there, played Michigan in that title game. They have the smallest percentage of returning production on offense of any team in the country. Their win total is seven. And that might be high in this new league. So I just think that it's a good reminder that this is the time of year we should be doing our homework on these teams. Don't just assume because Alabama's won 10 games every year for the last 10 years that they're going to win 10 again. Don't just assume that Michigan, because they won a national championship last year, is going to come back and be in the playoff. There are a lot of other factors at play here. And just because a name is a name doesn't mean that you can automatically bet in on them. So it's just, it's more just a cautionary thing here. Um, now more than yeah. ever, with all of the change in college football, we got to be doing our homework. I would add one more to it. I would say get the betting guy because I think you're betting yeah. blindly if you don't have that guide in front of you with all the changes. All right, let's go into your wheelhouse. And Not that everything is in your wheelhouse. Connor McDavid has had a historic playoff run, and he's chasing Gretzky, and he's minus 200 to win the MVP. And I know you're never scared to bet the favorite. However, the Panthers are still big favorites to win the Cup. Are you, How are you attacking these markets? Um, Connor McDavid was a minus 150 favorite after Tuesday's game. He's already been bet up to minus 200. And I think people feel it's very cut and dry as if regardless of outcome that Connor McDavid is going to win the Conn Smythe Award in the Stanley Cup final. And I'm just saying proceed with caution in this awards market because if you're placing a bet on this market right now, you're betting on two things with the scope of understanding that A, this is a market that's volatile as hell and B, you're either betting on or against history. And for the volatility, I just referenced how Connor McDavid is up to minus 200. He was plus 750 going into that game on Tuesday. He was more than 20 to 1 the game prior when Sergei Bobrovsky was a minus 550 favorite. It's all over the place. It's eerily similar to what we saw in the NBA Finals where Jalen Brown was minus 235 going into game five. Jason Tatum, by the end of that game, was bet up to over $3, and it still ends up being Brown winning. So just take that into account. Then to the historic side of it, it's been decades since a player who lost the Con Smythe, who lost the Stanley Cup, won the Con Smythe. There have only been five players ever to do it. Four of them were goalies. The only skater to ever do it was in 1976. So if you're betting Connor McDavid, and he has had a historic postseason, you're betting that he'll also make history in this market. Or are you going to bet on the history of the voters who have shown year in and year out that they don't bet or they don't select a player from the losing team? And then that opens up a whole other can of worms of who on the Florida Panthers would be worthy of Conn Smythe at this point. Because while Bobrovsky, as I referenced, was minus 550, you can't give it to him at this point. A big part of the argument for Alexander Barkov was the defensive ability that he was bringing in his two-way game, shutting down the Connor McDavid line. Feels like you can't give it to him anymore. So does it have to be Connor McDavid? I don't know. And so this is just one of those things where I say, if you're betting this market, I know it feels cut and dry. Connor McDavid, minus 200. He's going to win it. But recognize that nothing that is voted on by humans is ever a lock. And... I, I would have a little bit of fear if I believed that Florida was going to win this series, that they might just end up giving it to whoever has the best end of series performance from Florida, which I'm not saying it's right, but I could see it happening just because of history. Um, I, one, I think that's a great warning. I would say one, one, one last thing here, Michael, um, because I do think that it's warranted given that we're in the dog days of summer and I'll keep this one short and sweet, but I know like you, we're football people, right? A lot of the people that are listening to this show are football player people. And my last warning here is in the summertime, are we betting just to bet or are we betting to be profitable? Because if you're not somebody who grinds out Major League Baseball or you know nothing about soccer, we should not be betting full unit plays on these sports. And who am I to tell you what to do with your money, right? It's your own money. Bet what you want to bet. I love a pizza money play. I feel like 
there should not be rules in terms of betting. But if football is your bread and butter, you should be taking advantage of this opportunity to do the research, to checking out roster turnover, to making your lists of beat writers for the season. Like there are ways that you can be diving into futures markets and preparing to make money during the season versus throwing money away on sports you don't know anything about.